Great. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for coming. And thank you for inviting me along. And my name is Mark Riley from Matheson. Uh, last time we came here, there were 40 guests. And we went downstairs to, to do the simulator. I came 39th. So I'm the guy not to lose to <coughs> after this. And one word of warning, I, take five minutes before you get in your car and drive off. Because I got in the car and still thought I was in uh, Brazil and nearly hit a car coming out of the car park. It's so just cool down a bit before you leave. But um, yeah, thanks very much for inviting me. Uh, Jack and I met back in New York probably eight years ago now. And Jack pitched an idea to the company I was working for at the time, which was News Corp. Um, and about the same time, um, my boss at Dow Jones, part of News Corp, asked me to do an AI audit to figure out what we're using across the business. I then went on to meet about uh, 120 AI vendors um, and oftentimes got to the end of the meeting and had absolutely no idea what they were talking about. So I set up Matheson, which is an agency to connect CEOs to vendors. Um, if anyone can figure out where the name Matheson comes from, I will promise you some deeper insight swag after this. Uh, but um, I became absolutely fascinated with AI as part of my role as head of innovation for Dow Jones, where I was looking at emerging tech, disruptive tech. Uh, left New York, went from Brooklyn to Bristol, set up Matheson, went back to school at Oxford, uh, London Business School, and then here I am. So what I want to do today is just give you a very quick, we've got 10 minutes, a romp through um, how media companies have used AI up to date. And then what's happened in the last six months since ChatGPT emerged and how we've had to adapt. Uh, some of the clients I've worked for, the BBC studios, we worked with Deeper Insights last year. But primarily, the last eight years have been with News Corp, so working with brands such as Wall Street Journal, The Times and The Sun. Um, quick survey before we move on. I'm going to have, you've got four options here. So are you broadly an optimist? Do you think that it's, you're extremely excited and AI is going to be an impact for good around things like healthcare and climate change? Are you deeply concerned that it's an existential threat to the human race? Or are you a pragmatist and you think you just want to learn more and make it safe? Or are you a don't know? Now, you can be in more than one bucket, by the way. You can, you can choose two or three if you like. So quick show of hands, please. Who's uh, AI optimists in the room? Oh, they're, oh, my goodness. Well, thanks for showing up. <laughs> <laughs> Who's an AI pessimist? OK. Who's a pragmatist? Very good. And who's a don't know? Very good. So nice spread, mostly optimistic. Personally, I'm a optimist because generally there are so many pessimists which means that if there's enough pessimists around, they should figure out what can go wrong. So it won't go wrong, so we'll end up in the sunlit uplands. But what I will add is that most people, if we're honest, should be in the don't know bucket. Uh, and I think what this subject takes is a lot of humility. As Jack says, Tom says, this stuff is hitting us every day. We're learning stuff every day. Uh, so you need to sort of be flexible and adjust your position. But I, I do think we'll go into the, the arguments about optimism and pessimism. Um, I warn you, I have a tendency to become deeply philosophical, and my favorite dinner party topic is the singularity, uh, maybe for later over a coffee or a beer, but I'll try and keep this on the practicalities. And we'll dig in a little bit as to how a large org should adopt AI and, and the stuff I've learned about making it effective. So very quickly, this was a slide I gave a year ago. This is how a, a, a global media company might or might not adopt AI. And a year ago, the focus was very much around how can we find ROI? And every conversation was around finding savings or building new business models. So a lot of the interest was, so what can we do in HR and finance? And, but principally, it was more about how do we drive our business around subscription and advertising. And media companies are very simple businesses. You're either making money from advertising or you're making money from subscriptions. Bearing in mind, the last 10 years, it's gone from ads to subs. Subs are now the primary revenue. So we built intelligent paywalls. Wall Street Journal launched the first intelligent paywall. It lifted our subscribers from about 10% lift on hitting the paywall by knowing a lot about you when you hit the paywall. Churn reduction. How do we spot people who are going to cancel their subs and how do we save them? Ad targeting, making ad targeting more relevant, more personalized. 
And then if you can do really good content recommendation, which you already have seen on Amazon and on Netflix, you're going to get longer engagement. People stay around on the new site longer, and you make more ad revenue. So this is where it was all a year ago. And then there's some fun stuff we're looking at in the B2B world. If you've heard of a product called Factiva, we're ingesting Factiva. But it was all a bit over the horizon. What sort of predictions could you make doing that? Now, a year ago, in italics, I wrote customer service question mark, article writing question mark. It didn't even happen back then. It didn't exist. Uh, and then, holy crap, this happened around November. And to, to media companies, this, this was seismic. This was profound. This was something that turned up that we didn't expect much faster than we possibly could have imagined. And it was a bot that could effectively write content. And we were in the content business. Journalists are content creators. This was an existential threat to the business model. So we've had a while now with my various media clients just sifting through the pros and cons and seeing what could possibly go right, what could possibly go wrong, and how we approach this new paradigm. Now, everything we do in a newsroom or a news organization has been impacted by AI. So a couple of examples. So this process for an investigative journalism story, let's take, for example, the Panama Papers. Two terabytes of data. It took 40 journalists two years to crack the Panama Papers, if you remember that, which was bubbling up the uh, tax evasion um, issues. Now, uh, that process, two years, could probably be done in a month now. Because you've now got computational journalists who are doing news gathering, essentially means looking through reams and reams of Excel spreadsheets to find out the abnormalities and the fraud cases. That's much, much quicker. You've now got large language models that would change those findings into articles. And now the distribution is using AI to be far more personalized and targeted. So this is all happening at a much faster lick, which is great. We're more efficient, we're augmented. However, this forecast was actually made in 2020 from Nina Schlick, is that 90% of online content will be AI generated by 2025. Good news, bad news, do we care? I mean, it doesn't matter. The two things, one, there's going to be a bunch more content out there. And in every advertising copy you're going to read, it's going to be AI generated. Most articles will be AI generated. <coughs> Does that matter? There's going to be a heck of a lot more of it. So I'm an optimist here. Two things, I think one is that there will be a need to sift through the noise. There's going to be so much noise out there that you will need some kind of way of finding what's actually true and what's relevant to you. I also, and this is, I'm going out on a limb here, I suspect people will pay a premium for human-generated content in the future. Uh, the only thing I'm going on here is that at Christmas I did a two-minute video clip for my family, which is the best photos from 2022. And it was pictures of all my nieces and nephews and whatnot. Uh, and one niece said to me, she, her picture was obviously, she said, is that done by you or was it done by a bot? I don't know, it's done by me. She said, oh, great, because my picture's in it. That's great. But if it had been done by a bot, it's been computer generated, it was meaningless. So that's my hunch that people will, especially around opinion pieces, will lean towards quality, human, generated, and curated journalism. But I may be wrong. Now, <laughs> this presents a problem for media companies. Um, so it's all really early days, but there's, there's a bunch of people in the creative industry, whether that's music or art or, or journalists or writers, content creators, who are deeply upset that their style and their content, and their data, their IP is being ingested by these models and regurgitated for, for, for commercial gain. Now, how do we know that OpenAI or ChatGPT is using the Wall Street Journal or Reuters as training data? Well, we asked it. And it told us, these are the newspaper sites that I'm <coughs> training my data on. This is really early days. It's going to go to the courts. It's going to get messy. Can there be some sort of remuneration for the content creators for their IP that's being ingested in these machines? Or as they're arguing, it's a fair use case just to use it as training data. But even more importantly, once that data appears as an answer in a large language model, how do you even prove that it's been copyrighted or plagiarized? You can't, frankly. You can't unscramble the egg. So this is going to be one fascinating case to watch. Uh, I have a hunch that the large language models will win. 
because technology has a habit of winning, but pity the poor content creators whose hard work and endeavors are now being spat out in a big aggregated sense. So watch this space. Um, I don't know if anyone has any opinions on that or where that's going, happy to discuss that in more detail. Uh, so we're going to the pessimistic case first, and um, this is what I call the tyranny of plausibility, uh, and this is my biggest fear personally when it comes to media manipulation. So all well and good in the right hands, and we, I trust that open AI is run by good people who abide by the law. This powerful technology in the wrong hands uh, is incredibly, incredibly dangerous, and I think we got a sort of first whiff of it with Cambridge Analytica manipulating Facebook ads for the, for the benefit of the Trump campaign. And you can see how powerful that was in swinging the election. Now, this technology is infinitely more powerful. And we've already seen deep fakes that came out. Did anyone see the Pope in a puffer jacket? Did anyone see Trump getting arrested? These tools in the wrong hands uh, is extremely manipulative. Now, manipulation on one side is advertising. Advertising is manipulation. So manipulation is good. advertising is going to use this technology to become far more effective at putting the right message in front of you at the right time. That's all well and good. But manipulation on the other end of the spectrum is worrying to me in the sense that it can cause unrest. You could probably start a riot in London tonight if you really wanted to with the right distribution. So how do we regulate against that? How do we stop that? That's my main concern. Now, there are a bunch of other people who are in the negative camp. Um, and I can share these links with you. These are all great reads. So Noam Chomsky got a bit upset, got on his high horse, said this is all a load of baloney because it's not coming from a human. It's all just, what, have you heard of stochastic parrot? It's just the idea that this machine is just spitting out perfectly, sorry, nothing original. It's just regurgitating. These guys fall into the shit in, shit out camp um, on one side, and then you've got the other people who fall into this is gonna wipe out us as a species camp. So this is an amazing article, 8,000 hours, uh, which comes up with five plausible scenarios where AI goes rogue uh, and the planet st stops functioning, and these are the things we can do to, to mitigate against that. This is a lovely article in The Guardian about uh, how it's appropriating content and there's absolutely nothing original about it whatsoever. Uh, this is talking about the incoming battle I was talking about to, around copyright and plagiarism. This one's around hacking, so AI in this, in this margin can be used to uh, do phishing attacks and all sorts of cybersecurity risks. This one's lovely. This is a lovely post called the Luigi Effect, which argues that the harder you train, the better you train a model to behave well and be nice, the easier it is to flip it and turn it into its evil twin. And if someone's so inclined, it doesn't matter how hard you try to make it behave well, it's actually flippable quite, quite easily. Uh, and then deep fake news. Um, and uh, yeah, JP Morgan, sorry, Morgan Chase stopped their co colleagues using it. Now, on the optimist, so our Promethean moment. Um, this is as big as fire. This is as big as electricity. This is bigger than the internet. This is bigger than your, cell, than your mobile phone. Lovely article by Kissinger and Schmidt saying this is the biggest thing since the Enlightenment. This is a huge, vast treasure trove of knowledge that's going to prove us as a species. Let the gold rush begin. Um, lots of people are using it. So there's plenty of, uh, again, I'll share these links if you want to go into them. However, back on the shop floor, the <laughs> message to colleagues is keep calm and carry on. So yeah, that's great. I have a philosophical chat. We've got to get on with making money. So this is how I think about innovation very quickly. We have three buckets, minor improvements, build a new product, build a new business. OK, I'll, I'll go into that in a little bit more detail. So in the old world, box one for me was new website fix, possibly could do a new geography or build your market share. And box three was an adjacent market. So in the new AI paradigm, we're now talking about streamlining ops, getting new data sets, or radically driven new products and businesses. Now in generative AI, this is what's happening in the newsroom. We're looking at personal tools and plugins, such as Copilot, anyone using Copilot already? 
And then box two, we've got homegrown solutions, enterprise solutions, building MVPs, proof of concepts, product plugins. And this is where it gets super interesting for a media company. Uh, what corporate ventures can we do? What new startups can we do? What acquisitions? And should we be building our own large language model? Now, the reason for showing you this slide is just a word about methodology. Anyone from a large org, there's two ways I would view AI adoption. One is bottom up, i.e. by osmosis, giving your colleagues permission to try stuff and then share what's working. And then top down, which is strategic private equity mindset, you're going to make large bets build out a proof of concept and start a new company, which is going to be revenue increasing. Most of these are efficiencies, revenue saving. These are new revenue lines. Uh, now, in the newsroom, the specific tools and tips we're using, summarizations, an obvious one, research prompts and alerts. The biggie that they're using it most for in newsrooms at the moment is transcription. So if you have an interview with someone, you've got an hour of recording, Traditionally, you'd have to play it back in your headphones and type the whole thing out. And now the whole thing's done for you and summarized and, and put into an article. Tagging for SEO, social media posts, comment moderation. So the Times is already using it to stop toxic comments uh, and improve the, the quality of the conversation under an article. Text to voice is huge. Uh, entity extraction, topic extraction. Again, the interesting thing in box three, what can use generative AI for? Fake news detection. There's an AI race, there's a war going on, AI to detect AI. Can you actually detect chat GPT written articles? I don't think you can. <laughs> Jack won't differ. Uh, can you use it to, this one's really interesting. If you've got a, a, a large media company, you've got a fantastic archive, probably 10, 20, 30, maybe 100 years of content. Can you build your own large language model? Uh, it's effectively um, the Wall Street Journal, the BBC has its own chat GPT that speaks in its own voice, but only references its own history, historical content. So you basically have the smartest chatbot in your room when it comes to financial news or sport or technology, whatever you want your chatbot to talk about. Then predictive and trends, so you can actually use it to look forward to events such as stock and commodity moves, M&A activity, political risk, uh, supply chain analysis. There's a whole bunch of stuff that you can now do around prediction. So as Tom said, it's heating up. We've got Google, Bard, OpenAI, Meta, Claude from Anthropic, are all out in the wild. And we've got tools that we've already been using in the newsrooms. Uh, Otter will take notes. Meltwater does sentiment analysis. Uh, this one will take financial new data and turns it into news. Uh, so bits and pieces already going on. This is just going to get faster and faster. Finally, uh, show me the money. <coughs> so uh, these companies, NVIDIA's in the room, um, obviously the big five are already priced in their stock price mostly in terms of they won the, the cloud wars, they're now starting to win the Gen AI wars. Facebook's leading on research probably, Microsoft and Google are leading on the M&A activity, they're investing in startups. Apple's interestingly leading in acquisitions. Um, clearly teaming up with the foundational models. Now for me, this is where the fun bit is, because this is back to the gold rush. If you're, if you're a punter, there's plenty of opportunities for these fast up and coming applications. There's going to be a massive rationalization because a lot of them will be disintermediated by the models opening up their own APIs, the old Sherlock. So you can get done in if OpenAI build an API into a travel portal, then your travel app will be dead in the water. So it's going to be a big falling out for a lot of these apps in the next three to five years. My personal opinion is the, the real value add is someone who can train a model to be highly specialized in a vertical. So if you're in a financial analyst environment or a medical environment or educational environment or a therapy environment, you will have the, world, you'll have the world's best trained large language model specific to your industry or vertical. And those guys will start to own their space. And those guys will clean up 
but there's going to be a massive fight to own that space in the first place. That's going to be a two, three to ten year shakeout. Final takeaways, it's out of the box, <laughs> run towards it, don't run away from it. Please keep a human in the loop, you know, there's so much um, potential for, for harm if people don't check what's been published. Ethical guidelines, companies will go bust because they, they completely screw up on their ethics and their guardrails. Um, and, and please go back to that second slide I had about other use cases. We're all kind of in the spotlight, right? Now. The street light effect is the drunk looking for his wallet under the street light. The policeman says, what are you doing here? He said, well, I lost my wallet in the park. He said, well, why are you looking here? Because it's under the street light. I got some light here. So just saying, don't get completely obsessed by generative AI. There's a ton of other interesting uh, upsides from ROI in ROI and other applications across the business and disrupt or be disrupted. And there's a quote from a famous Argentinian writer, which I quite enjoyed. That was written by a human, by the way. <laughs> uh, and that's me. Um, Matheson, anyone know where Matheson comes from? Alan Turing's, uh, Turing's middle name. We've got some swag, this <laughs> uh, This is my, kind of what I do, uh, day job, this is working with Deeper Insights. And by the way, I'm not being paid to say this, I can't praise Deeper Insights enough. They're an absolute joy to work with and you know, um, really smart people who do really great stuff. So if you're interested in, in that kind of process, this QR code will take you to my TAPI and the presentation and other presentations if of interest. That's all I've got, it's coffee, I think. Yeah, that's right, folks.